time for a strategy lesson, guys. This one is going to be taken from a very important recent game um, played in the 13th round of the candidates tournament between Gukesh and Faruja. And uh, Gukesh won this game and that set him up to win the candidates. So, um, however, it didn't look like he was doing that great um, in the opening. He was playing with the white pieces. And here, Ali Reza played a move that is already very instructive. Um, Black has a space advantage in the center that he's supporting with his knight, pawn, and queen. Meanwhile, what are white's ideas? Well, white does have this active leap to f5 with the knight. And, you know, generally, we don't want to be trading off our bishops for knights. So... Faruja played g6. I really liked this move um, because although it does weaken the king and you have to be careful with moves like that when you don't have a fianchettoed bishop on g7, but the whole point is that this bishop just cannot jump out to g5, right? There's really no good way to get this knight out of the way to unleash the bishop. So that's what that move is based on. So it's a nice prophylactic move and white played rook e1, bishop e6, so now black has a chance to develop once they're done stopping white's ideas, and h3. And here black definitely um, made an inaccurate move. They played rook e8, stepping into this attack by the bishop. Unfortunately, there's no good way to block it. Um, if you try to use these minor pieces, then that pawn is going to hang. So he wound up going e4 to kind of get rid of this queen. But generally, black doesn't really want to be just trading pawns in the center because that means trading off his space advantage. So basically, white's position really doesn't look so bad anymore, and it was kind of a balanced game for this next stage. So... Instead of this move rook e8, I was analyzing um, another option, which is the move king g7. Very logical, giving this knight some support. And so this next position that we're going to get to is just a product of my analysis. Um, let's say we trade, they take, this pawn is hanging, f6 makes a lot of sense, and queen g3. And I came upon this position and I realized that this is actually a great learning example. The question is, what should black do? And I think for most students, I mean, it could even be like under 2000 where this would not really be an obvious situation. Like if we're talking about 1500, even more so, like I'm quite sure that, you know, if I was black, I'd still be pretty proud to play what the computer says is the best move in this position. So it's definitely instructive. But let's get back to our favorite question, guys, which is, okay, what are the opponent's ideas in this position, right? Because I've had students who are quite advanced and they look at this position and they're like, let's improve the rook or let's, I don't know, play on the queen side right? Like all of these are viable plans, but they really miss the mark in terms of understanding, like, first of all, well, why did the white queen even go there? And what are white's ideas? It's actually quite clear that white's main active idea involves attacking your center, right? Because black is a very powerful center. And whenever you have a center like that, you should expect your opponent to attack it. So g5 or d4, Right, so the main issue here is how do you plan on protecting your space? Now, again, to students in the 1000 to 1500 level, um, a move like queen d7 might seem logical, right? You connect your rooks, develop your queen, and attack a pawn. Looks great, right? But again, it doesn't do anything to stop that move, it actually just encourages it. And I had an example with a student of mine. Uh, I was playing this position out. And then he played bishop b8. Um, pawn takes and rook takes. And by the way, yeah, we're going to flip the board for a second because now it's a chance to find 
something instructive for white that I think a lot of people would kind of struggle with. Um, there's a couple of promising moves here as white. One of them is queen h4, threatening bishop h6. And that's, you know, quite nice. But when I was playing this position with my student, I mean, in my mind, it's like there was no way I was not going to sack this exchange. Right. And this is maybe one of the differences between like master level players and kind of any anything below that, really, because we know that people are reluctant to sacrifice material at, uh, you know, the intermediate levels in chess. And why is this move like very, very intuitive to like a stronger player? Well, I mean, this is black center. So you're not just taking something small from him. You're taking like the pride of his position and you're getting the impressive dark squared bishop. So as compensation, what you have here is the dark squares. King safety, right? So that's kind of a pretty tempting reason to sacrifice an exchange. Now, if black could get a queen trade here, you really wouldn't want to go into this position, but they just don't have a good way to offer you a queen trade. Meanwhile, you're threatening bishop g5. So the best move is this. And now black has ideas of like rook f5. They also generally might want to play like rook e8 at some point. And in this position, I think what I played was this move d4 to stop rook f5, right? So I meant this as a prophylactic move, and it's not a bad move. I mean, it opens the bishop. But after something like bishop g4 with the idea of rook e8, it's actually black is still in the game. So... Here the computer kind of was improving on my play with this move queen d4. That's a really cool move. Didn't really come to my mind because I was kind of eager to open up that bishop. But he just says, all right, get the queen out of that file. And uh, then you can just sort of develop this bishop wherever you want, bring in the rook to the open file. And white is better. So personally, you know, I love these kinds of concepts in chess, little material sacrifices for long-term positional compensation. So this type of idea is um, right up my alley. And yeah, in the game, I just could not resist, you know, showing my young students, you know, why, um, you know, you can give up a rook for a bishop and pawn, why it's worth it. By the way, if they try to exploit the pin like that, fortunately, we still have the same kind of concept to protect the rook and open up the bishop, and we're still going to be better. So what's the lesson? The lesson is, first of all, well, that exchange sacrifices are often a very effective weapon um, to take away a lot of the strengths of your opponent's position. And um, the kinds of things that I look for when considering exchange sack are definitely... King safety, does it lead to my opponent's king being more unsafe? Pawn structure, you know, are the, is their pawn structure getting ruined along the way? Or in this case, just the valuable center pawn getting eliminated? And, um, you know, I would say another one, weak squares, right? Like, so when you get to this position, it's like the, you can feel how weak the dark squares are and the potential of this dark squared bishop on c1. So you're looking for like any number of these factors when you're considering an exchange sacrifice. But okay, let's get back to our initial position where it was Black's turn. And so the point is that you don't want to miss your opponent's ideas. You don't want this move to come as some kind of a surprise and then find your strong center weakened and even leaving yourself open to sacrifices against that center, right? Um, so, for example, you might say, well, shouldn't I just protect that pawn then? Like, go bishop b8. But again, g5 can happen. And by the way, if you go here, 
don't be surprised when this move happens again. Your opponent will happily sacrifice a rook for a bishop and pawn in order to get all of your dark squares. So what should we do? Well, I mean, you could do something like h6, perhaps. Um, but it's not as effective as the move that um, is the computer's favorite. And the reason I think is that when they go d4 and they st start striking from this direction, um, they have this square available for their bishop, and this is kind of, in general, a nice diagonal for them to take. So the best move in this position, you might be getting close to figuring it out, is the move g5. Really cool prophylactic move. You guys probably know by now I'm a big fan of this type of thinking in chess, right? Stopping my opponent's ideas. And it's not really intuitive unless you're very aware of what your opponent's counterplay is. I mean, why would you be pushing pawns in front of your king like that? It looks even a little bit weakening. But, you know, you can definitely check out those sacrifices um, you know, make sure nothing is happening there, but you will indeed be safe. Like if they decide to give up the bishop for a couple of pawns, you could go rook f6, you could go queen f6 as well. So that doesn't work. And basically, you know, white can either try to strike at your center or go bishop e3, trading pieces. Here you have an interesting choice, by the way trade or not. I mean, you could trade, you're still better, but the computer actually prefers this move. Now, why would we spend a move retreating? Um, because we have more space, and when we have more space, we generally don't want to trade pieces. And then there's this very interesting move, rook h8. It just kind of shows you, like, black's potential for attack in this position, that we can even afford something like that. You know, obviously, you can bring your queen to d7. I mean, what makes black's position so strong here is this center, right? And as long as he can keep it, he is going to be better, right? Strong center in chess is a massive advantage. Um, if white strikes at the center, we obviously need to move forward. When they strike again, we come around this way. And... Actually, everything works out in Black's favor. You know, here this move is quite strong, you know, threatening to invade with the queen and then bringing in the bishop to g3. You can also even just go with f5, right? So there's actually a lot of options for how Black can be better here. And if the queen goes to h3, there's a move that I think is really cool, h5. Um, you know, using the fact that they cannot take you because their queen actually gets trapped. And otherwise, you succeed in opening up kind of a nice initiative on the king side here. So the lesson from this example is really that when you look at a position, let's just go back for a second. When you look at a position, um, you don't want to miss that step in the thinking process where you figure out, like, what are my opponent's main ideas, right? And certainly when you have a space advantage, you should be assuming that your opponent would like to attack that if he has a chance. So moves like g5 and d4 should really not be striking you uh, by surprise if you are um, employing this thinking process, right, of like, what does my opponent want? Like, if you're completely oblivious to all of that, then, you know, every move your opponent makes will be a surprise to you and potentially uh, an unpleasant one, right? So that's why we want to avoid that. We want to be aware of what the opponent wants. And sometimes we have a chance to stop their ideas in an effective way. And that's why I really, like, enjoyed this pawn move g5, because it's so effective, right? Like, you just completely stop white from moving up that pawn, you kind of solidify your space. It really doesn't weaken the king and um, gives you these cool ideas with like h5 later on, fixes that pawn as a kind of a target, and even, you know, stops this bishop 
from developing to f4, which is a nice point. So yeah, this is really, um, this example, it's all about prophylactic thinking and hopefully you guys uh, will benefit from that.